are you satisfied with your understanding of sustainability? If you are not, imagine a journey together, a pluralistic one, with academia, innovators, startups, NGOs, all looking for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. My name is Samuele Tini, and this is the Sustainability Journey. Welcome to another episode. And today we are going to discuss something that is really important. The voice of women, the underrepresented in the climate discussion. And we do it with the co-founder of She Changes Climate, Bianca Pitt. Bianca, thank you so much for being here. Great to be here today. Thank you, Sam, for inviting me to come and speak to your listeners and your audience today. For me, it's a pleasure to have a change maker like you discussing such an important topic. But as usual, as our listeners, they know, we always start. Can you tell about yourself, your sustainability journey? How you have become you know, a leader in this field? So, you know, how did I become interested in sustainability and climate change? I had a background in law and business, media and corporate finance. And I took a sabbatical to spend some time with my newborn daughter. That's over 13 years ago now. And that gave me the opportunity to read up about what was happening in the wider world beyond my own industry interest. Because as you know, if, if you're working in an industry, we're usually very focused on what happens within it. And that often doesn't give us the opportunity to really see the wider picture. And um, I have to say, the more I read and the more questions I asked, and the more I also looked what was happening around me, I saw that our ecosystems had dramatically changed since I had been a child. Not only did we have almost double the world's population since I was born. So I think I was only 36 years old at the time I had my first child. And indeed, in that time, we had seen a dramatic increase in people living on the planet. But we were still operating with the old operating systems, the old finance system, transport system, energy system, food system that we'd operated with when we started the industrialization almost. And that clearly wasn't going to work. We weren't going to be sustainable if so many people demanded the use of products and services on planet with finite resources. More worrying though, you know, our ecosystems weren't just impaired. We could see that they were quickly, quickly shifting. And I have to say, we are, you know, looking really at the collapse of these ecosystems that are the underlying infrastructure to all our lives. You know, we we rely on them to provide clean air, clean water, the food from the soil. And we also rely on dependable weather, essentially, to fuel our economy. What became clear during COVID was that how intrinsically linked our environmental, social, and economic systems are. And seeing the environmental system so under peril made me want to change my own career. I wanted to create a better world for my child. And I decided to take a leave from what I was doing before and really focus on mitigating the course of action and focus on transforming our operating systems. Uh, from this tiny import, this inspired you to co-found She Changed Climate. So what are the key goals of the campaign? What is it? Can you explain a bit more? So I spent some, quite some time trying to understand the barriers to success. You know, I was a, an advisor to the environmental charity sector, sitting on the boards of many charities in the space. And the question was really, why aren't we seeing the climate action that we need now? How can it be that we have this massive problem and people prefer to ignore it or look away? I think we see the perfect storm at the moment. We see people paralyzed by trauma, be that individual, ancestral, societal trauma. And we also have inadequate leadership. You know, looking at leadership, it's quite obvious that we're missing women. We need many more change makers, obviously, to come on board now to bring their vision, their ideas, and their experience. I mean, after all, transforming our operating system is not a small job. We need a lot of actors on the scene to work on this. The absence of women and underinvestment in women is really staggering. They form only 7% of the FTSE 100 CEOs, only 16% of board members worldwide, only 25% of parliamentarians, and 20% of ministers. 
Many countries have never had a female leader. The Supreme Courts have dwindlingly low numbers. For example, the American Supreme Court had only 3.5% female members. And if we look at the financing into women's ideas, I'd say the number there is, is for me, certainly one of the most shocking. Only 2 to 3% of venture capital funding goes to women-led teams. 2 to 3%. How are we supposed to innovate, recreate, redesign, rebuild if we don't bring new architects and builders on board? I had founded the Women of the Environment Network, which was a group of female environmental philanthropists, founders and CEOs of charities and foundations and influencers. And you can imagine our surprise, you know, given that there were lots of leading voices in climate on this network, when the UK government announced the COP26 leadership team and there wasn't a single woman on it. It seemed like this was some bizarre oversight and we thought at the time that we could just speak to the government, point out that they'd forgotten to look at talent from half the UK's and the Commonwealth's people and um, they would just fix the team and we could all go on uh, with our other jobs. But to an, our absolute amazement, those women were not appointed. They didn't bring climate experts on board to co-lead the conference. So what we had to do is set up the She Changes Climate campaign and to ask for 50-50 vision at the top of COP. This is what we're demanding. There is a policy document, the so-called Gender Action Plan, that sets out that women have to be equally represented at all levels of COP. But this is routinely ignored. We need to see either the president be a woman. So in 28 years of cops we have only had four female presidents which is why we are now asking for a co-presidency perhaps that helps it's just easier if we appoint a man and a woman to lead the conference together then we automatically represent a hundred percent of the world's population as the conference of the party really set out to do we also are asking for 50 50 vision on all the delegations and all the panels and the latest idea is to create a pavilion at COP28 to highlight the importance of women as change makers, because what we see is that there's a huge amount of educating and explaining to do. Still, people don't understand what role women have to play in this, and they don't understand just how critical they are for our success. And we will be approaching the UAE and others for funding on that. I mean, I didn't know. It's really saddening, I mean, because I thought I, I was there at COP26 and I didn't notice. I think it's really important to point out this. I, I think that is also where I think I, I first sent a glimpse of your work there in Glasgow. And I want to stress a bit more about that, the increasing female representation in climate decision making. What are you really the core of your campaign? the 50-50 you're discussing, the co-presidency, and the new initiative at COP28 in, in Dubai this year. So why is so important? And really, which are the barriers that the women face in this area? Why? Because we know we have amazing women, amazing change makers. Why they still face this, these barriers to be an equal part in this, especially in this arena? I think the problem is that we've become so used to, to this male-led society. You know, we have had, according to researchers, we've had 10,000 years of a patriarchy. And it's our def the default mode to simply choose the man. Uh, all the research shows that men are always the first to be chosen for pretty much everything. Even women vote for men when it comes to reposting people on the internet they won't repost what women say, they will repost what men say. And it is absolutely staggering to see this bias that we are operating in, men and women. We have all the same view, basically. Also, at the same time, we have this problem that since women don't see other women lead, they think, or well, now, you know, with the example of the climate negotiations, if they see it just run by men, they rightly think, what does this have to do with me? These guys can't decide for me. So without them seeing that they are being also led by their own kind, they will not buy into whatever policy will come out of COP. 
and we need them for the implementation of the policies. We know that, particularly because women work on the ground in communities. They play such an important role as community leaders. So we've got to invite them also into the decision making. I think given that we have so far mainly operated without women taking the lead on decisions at COP, you know, means defining the narrative, framing and agenda. That means we're operating in a blind spot uh, in which really only male masculine priorities are heard. Uh, we're now at COP28 and emissions are still rising. I mean, we're now witnessing an extinction event. What more evidence do we need that our existing leadership structures are not sufficient, right? The climate emergency is a direct result of our social inequalities. It's the result of excluding the voices of the many. And research confirms this. You know, it's not only fair, but also smart to have women in leadership. But they have a material effect on climate policy and policy implementation. You know, whether it's on boards or in governments, they're more likely to ratify environmental treaties. They're more likely to protect habitat. They even the spending women spend differently to men. They go for the for lower carbon products and services. It's absolutely fascinating to see even that broken down to the individual level. Women take different choices, more environmentally friendly choices. But the barriers are clear. The barrier is simply that are socioeconomic in parts. So they they don't have the funding to make themselves heard. They don't. They can't. They struggle with all the other duties that they have. You know, caring for the young, caring for the old, usually unpaid. Seventy five percent of the world's unpaid care work is provided by women. So they are really really busy. And if we don't free them up, that means also let men take over some of the roles that women have traditionally taken. We are going to really struggle to empower them and get them into play here. So it's it's a matter of, and as Cheryl Sandberg coined that so nicely, she said, lean in to the women and to the men. We also have to say, please reach out and get the women in. That is a very good way to join us together and really solve this crisis because there's no point to continue with the old paradigms where a planet maybe in the te next 10 or 15 years the, the tipping point will be irreversible so with a dying planets the old paradigm <laughs> they're losing not only they, they are not they should not be there actually we have we have now to put ourselves at work and we should have done i mean i think maybe a decade or two decades ago and that's why it's important, you know, I think campaign like yours and the work you're doing, they are trying to really push uh, towards achieving this goal. And, you know, you, you started at 20, COP26, now you are going to talk COP28. 20, uh, Which are the milestones, the impact that you, you have done today? What have you reached with uh, your campaign and that uh, really helped in solve the, the, the core problem that you have identified to change climate? The major achievement for us has so far been to draw attention to the issue. So we had 154 million views of the campaign in the first year of operation and major news coverage on BBC, Financial Times, Forbes, etc. This year we have a first female high-level champion again, thank goodness, uh, Razan Al-Mubarak. There are always two high-level champions. It's the current presidency and the previous presidency that each um, lend a high-level champion to COP. And she is also the leader of the IUCN. That's a body that governs biodiversity around the world. We also see that female ministers are involved, which is very encouraging. So what we need to see is simply high-level women taking the seat at the decision-making table and being involved with the narrative, the framing, and the, the agenda of the COP in each country. But we've also got to let them take some of the credit and we've got to shine a light on them because they are still in a minority. Uh, we still don't have 50-50 vision. And um, raising awareness about it is one thing. I cannot tell you yet whether we, you know, we still haven't achieved what we wanted to achieve. We don't have 50-50 vision at COP. It is still faulty. It is still insufficient and it will not churn out the results that we need to all see as humanity from these conferences. Overall, the gender gap is actually widening. So it's now, according to the World Economic Forum, 132 years. 
The UN yesterday announced that, according to their research, uh, it's 300 years. I have to look at the metrics exactly and, and understand why that differs so much. And what they're saying is that the situation for women and girls is deteriorating around the world. We know that there's been a dramatic reversal in sort of rights for women, you know, like the abortion rights. That has been a huge problem. We have, for example, Afghanistan, in which girls are not allowed to go to school anymore. Iran has also currently not really responded to the protests. The government certainly hasn't responded to the protests in the country and made amendments. The bad news is basically, you know, it's getting worse. And COVID was an interesting example. So as, so as the economic situation deteriorates worldwide, um, the situ women and girls are more negatively affected. Uh, they're more negatively affected by climate change. Uh, nat in natural catastrophes, they're more likely to drown and to lose their home. The majority of homeless people are women. They usually have to take the children and the elderly with them and can't, you know, in, in, say in floods, they can't save themselves. They are, are busy saving others. And the problem is that, for example, with COVID, it was that we saw that women were the first to lose their jobs and they were less likely to come back into work, even when the situation allowed them to again. So because of their lower socioeconomic status, they are worse affected as the economy deteriorates. And, and I want really to touch on these challenges that you have really highlighted and this deteriorating situation, which is also coupled and maybe exacerbated by the, our climate crisis. Those are the, the, the biggest challenges in promoting the gender equality. But how we can overcome them? What we can do? I think it's a very good question. I think we have, it's been very interesting last year to see simply how the, you know, the war in the Ukraine hit the headlines and more or less completely crowded out everything else. The cost of living crisis was the second factor that, you know, dominated the headlines. And if you have two events essentially it's that demand so much attention and are covered by the news it's very very difficult to make progress on any other topics that also need our attention um, so I would say that is a massive massive challenge for us is how on earth we even get the headlines how do we get the bandwidth how do we get the space in media to promote this course and to talk about it the other challenge I found is is actually interesting from men themselves. Uh, I felt that there's been huge reluctance, fear, even you know, suspicion on uh, what this exactly entails. This idea of empowering women. I think it's got to do with the fact that men are not happy either. Particularly, you know, they have been operating in a very, very narrowly defined definition of masculinity. You know, it's, success is very much measured on financial success, for example. So if you're not financially successful, how successful are you really then as a man? You know, it's even the clothes they have to wear. <laughs> they have been reduced to a very, very narrow version of what a man can really be. And in some countries, women have made progress, you know, they, they are free to study, they are, you know, if they're not happy, they meet their friends and talk about things. And men don't feel that change has happened for them in the same way. Hence, they are very, they are hedging themselves and they are, they're very cautious and they are concerned that they might lose their status, which is so important in the current definition of masculinity against some other people you know whether that's a, a woman or someone else doesn't matter and I think the challenge is to explain really how we are stronger together we have to explain that diversity benefits everybody you know it's all our success if women are empowered and co-lead together with the men I've also had a personal challenge. I don't like public speaking or didn't like public speaking. I felt that I had marbles in my mouth when I was first asked to come on stage. Uh, I hear I'm not alone. Apparently, according to research, 78% of people fear public speaking more than death. Uh, that's a quite an interesting piece of information. 
And it helped me to simply remember that I'm not speaking for myself here or I'm on my own behalf necessarily. I'm really speaking for nature. You know, nature, our environment doesn't have a voice and it needs us human beings to listen, to watch and to then talk. And that's helped me greatly because now when I go on stage, I have absolutely no problem saying what I think should be said and has to be said. And I would say losing sort of my ego in the process has been wonderfully liberating. And it's something I can only recommend to others. And thank you for sharing also this personal touch. I think it's really important. A bit, I can say also myself, when I started, it was a bit difficult, you know, for me, not an ATC and, and from the corner of Africa, going and discuss and meet change makers like you, it was not easy. But now I think just like with your example and other change makers example and leaders, I think I've, I've grown and I'm, I'm glad to give this service to, to people like you. And I want to go back a bit where you said, you know, really the steps and how we, we can do, you know, your plans for the future of the campaign, especially because you have recognized from your analysis that really we are not yet there. The gap is there, of course, in some country there have been, I mean, good progress, but others no. Others we are going back. Which are the goals? How do you see, see evolving your campaign in the next in the next coming years? Also, I mean, given that the situation is deteriorating, you know, we really have a lot of work to do. Getting funding is the biggest practical challenge for us as a campaign, as an organization. Environmental funding over the last few years was only about two to three percent of philanthropic giving. And when it comes to women at the intersection of climate, that dwindles down to about 0.01%, according to some research. I think um, what, what's really important for campaigns like ours, and, and I think is important generally for companies, for organizations of any kind, is that we now listen. We really start listening. We have to listen to you know, nature and the environment. We have to watch what is going on. We have to listen to people who are working on the ground, the people who are actually affected by climate change, who are made homeless, who lose their livelihoods because they can't work on the fields anymore and harvests fail. They are displaced. Uh, they lose loved, beloved ones. You know, we will see a deterioration in our overall security and an increase in, you know, unfortunately in conflict as resources get fought over. And our role is to listen to the people on the ground and to then translate that, to make their voices heard by leaders in government today and also the finance industry and other industries that are absolutely vital for, you know, keeping the operating systems going essentially and improving the operating systems, as I mentioned earlier, to translate that and to bring that to their attention. So very much we work as a, with a top-down, bottom-up approach. We, we work with existing leaders and we also bring up um, women who are working on the ground, environmental defenders uh, who perhaps don't have an audience and who don't get heard in the worldwide press or who can't come to COP if you're not chosen for your delegation, your country delegation, and there are very few people who are chosen for this delegation, it's very difficult to go to COP, it's very expensive, you know, people don't have the funding, sometimes they can't even get a visa to leave their country or passport, and it's our job to help these people uh, come to these international climate negotiations because if they are not in the room, then we leave the field to the fossil fuel industry. And why is that? Because the fossil fuel industry, if it was a country, it would form the largest delegation at COP. There are so many executives from the fossil fuel industry, the lobbyists, that it would crowd out all the other voices <laughs> and all the other agendas. So humanity has to be represented at COP. Otherwise, it'll be left in business interest hands only. And going there, I think, thank you for this analysis. And I want to go there now towards the, we are approaching the end of the episode. We will discuss even more with you, but I'm sure we want also to see in the future, what are you going We see? I mean, uh, for coming episode and discussion, I, I want to go and, and discuss now. I am somebody in the audience. I know I recognize these problems, but what I can do, which, which are Bianca, advice for how an individual that listens to us can play a role. I mean, Simon, as you know, every one of us is called to be a change agent, right? 
I mean, looking out for women can start at home, really looking out for one's wife, one's daughters, mothers, sisters. You know, on social media, it's a matter of amplifying their voice. You know, are you giving, are you reading what women are posting? Are you connected to women? Are you reading what they say? Do you read books written by women? Uh, do you read books or articles, you know, that write about women's choices, women's experiences, their vision? What do we know about women, really, is a big question. When we it comes to voting, you know, are we actually giving fair chance to female candidates who are trying to step into that role? As a campaign, we are campaigning with the help of volunteers. So we welcome any pro bono work that anyone wants to give. You know, we have had people from the finance industry, advisors, and from the creative industries, uh, and that is hugely helpful. We are a co-created campaign. And we were designed to be an owner list campaign so that everyone can run their own She Changes Climate campaign. If you're a business leader, for example, you can do a screening within your company to talk about this subject. And you can, for example, create a She Changes Climate campaign within your own company, which looks at women and also climate. We're creating an ambassador's network and we are inviting participation. We have also had some men join, which is really exciting and we want to see it grow. So you're very welcome if you are a champion of women to come and join this ambassador's network. And yeah, I would say, you know, grow your own, you know, grow your knowledge about the subject, use your listening skills and, um, and then use this within your current expertise. I think it's very important to start at home with these things. And I think they are really very important points, actionable points for people that are listening to us. And I'm sure people maybe want to reach out. We put the contacts and see how they can engage, become ambassadors for people, business leaders and others to be really a voice and a support for, as you say, joining hands towards the resolution of this climate crisis. And the last point I want to ask, and we usually ask to our guests, is like, is your final call to action within this world of inequality, a world that needs to address this climate crisis and promote sustainability, which is your call to action to the people? It is to really get 50-50 vision implemented now. So if you're a business owner, for example, have you got a board? Does your board reflect that 50-50 vision? Do you have men and women taking decisions together in a balanced group or not? You know, much as you wouldn't sail around the world with one eye firmly shut up or if, you know, you wouldn't sail the world with one hand, say, tied behind your back. You don't want to be taking decisions without having full 360 degree vision, particularly if choppy waters lie ahead. And we all know since the pandemic that we have to build resilience. And we do that by getting 50-50 vision. The other thing to do is, is really starting with ourselves, you know, looking, getting ourselves into a good space, I say then building our own networks and and building on our networks and building on our expertise so it doesn't you know you don't have to be an expert on sustainability and climate to get started uh, in fact i think most people aren't when they get started you just have to be a concerned citizen really talking about it private and publicly is very important and we'll get you into the flow as well and linking up with others you know creating groups of people you know, a WhatsApp group or, or meeting up with friends or like-minded people, I think is, is a good way to start energizing yourself for this type of work. It's hard to do it completely on your own. And then not everyone's a founder or, or feels that they have entrepreneurial skills, but sometimes we find it easier simply to take action if we are a group and work together. So I co-founded She Changes Climate. I definitely wouldn't have done it on my own. I didn't have the risk appetite. And it helped to simply have, I had a group, an existing group, and someone in that group suggested we set this up. And we did it together. We shared the workload. Uh, we also share the fun, which is great. 
and um, that's often a good start to get going with these things and you know and listening again listening listening to others to into ourselves and to nature i think is really a good important thing to do when it comes to this journey thank you so much bianca for this wonderful episode has been a pleasure and i think you have taken from this bold step that you have decided with other people joining hands you have taken this campaign very far you are now pushing and working for the 50 50 representation and you have already achieved a lot in the climate space so thank you so much for your work and for being you know a change maker thank you very much for for giving us a voice sam really appreciate it are you satisfied after this wonderful episode let's continue together our sustainability journey